Welcome one and all to our webinar for tonight. This is Free from Full Features. And today we're going to be talking about US stock indices and uh, what's going to happen in Q3, the events and opportunities. All right. So this is a series of event, a series of webinar events uh, that have been done in conjunction with uh, our friends at CME Group. Um, we have uh, uh, we have Rachel, Rachel here with us today uh, from CME Group. If you have any questions on uh, products uh, related to CME Group, uh, uh, just type them in the question box uh, because we have Rachel on the line uh, who will be able to address them. Anything else to do with markets or certain views uh, or queries you may have, um, uh, Samuel will be able to address them. Uh, Samuel, as you know, is our investment analyst uh, of Phil Futures. Rachel, would you like to say a few words? Yeah, sure. Um, thank you all for your time for this evening. And um, um, well, because well, we have um, Samuel who's going to share you share with you all with about the CME products and um, all the trading strategies. But we do have all the CME resources online. For example, you can go to the CME Active Trader or CME Institute on other CME resources, which is all free online for your reference. So um, after the webinar, if you guys are interested in any of the CME resources, just feel free to let me know and let um, Sri know. Then we can send you the links and um, so that you can you can um, just take your time and get yourself some more familiar with the semi products. Thank you. All right, thank you so much, Rachel. Um, well, if you um, if it's uh, convenient for you right now, I mean, um, you may just uh, type the links for our audience into the chat box directly, so they can pick them up uh, as uh, right after the webinar. They can have a look at the content that you have there. All right. So in um, oh, okay. Thank you, Rachel. So in the in the first half of 2018, we had a whole lot of political events from the U.S. which dominated news headlines. All right, and we had key events uh, which moved the markets, including the soaring ties between the U.S. and its trading partners. And then we had warming relations with North Korea. Remember the Trump Kim summit in Singapore. And then um, and now we have the rising probability of a possible trade war with China. All right, so here to tell us what's going to happen in Q3 and, and, and beyond, we have Samuel Su, our investment analyst from Full Future. Samuel, without further ado, over to you. Uh, thank you, Sri. Uh, very good evening to everybody. So I'm Samuel from Philip Futures. I'm an investment analyst here. So just a little bit of break, uh, uh, background about myself. So uh, just a bit. Take a note first. Uh, everything that I said for this seminar was solely for education purpose, and uh, please seek professional advice before you make any investment decisions. So a little bit about myself. I'm an investment analyst with Philip Futures. So I actually specialize in the equities indices and forex market. On a day-to-day -day basis, I actually provide daily commentaries on indices and forex to our clients. I'm also a market commentator. So you may have seen me on TV, heard me on the radio, as well as see my commentaries on the newspaper before. I also do conduct uh, e uh, seminars on a day-to-day -day basis and have been involved with some big scale ones. Some of them will be include the Invest Fair last year, as well as the Lianhe Zaopao Forum this year itself. So for today's seminar, we'll actually delve into the topic and move on to the four, four key main points which we will cover with regards to US indices. Firstly, it's a little bit about the US indices futures. Next, we'll move on to the key drivers that moves the US indices. Lastly, we'll go on to the uh, factors which impacted the first half of uh, uh, impacted US in the first half of 2018, as well as our view and forecast for the third quarter of 2018 itself. So just a little start, we actually US indices comprise of four major indices. So we are going to break down and understand what each indices actually uh, represents and how we can actually diversify our, uh, our investment decisions with these four main indices. Firstly, will be the Dow in this, which is actually heavily weighted on in the industrial side of things, oil, etc., and finance. So we can see that uh, mainly news headlines actually report a lot about the Dow. Next is actually the S&P. The S&P is actually a well-balanced index, so it comprises also the majority stocks. And uh, sometimes it also has been used as a benchmark. 
the Russell 2000 index to some maybe something new, but actually it actually comprises of uh, 2000 uh, small and mid cap stocks. So it's actually a good diversification way as well as you can, you can use it to ride the wave for US indices because its volatility is greater. And the NASDAQ, as we all know, is heavily weighted in technology. So for the Dow, as stated just now, it comprises of 30 blue chip stocks and it's mainly the leaders in their particular industry. So we are able to see that based on the Dow itself, it's more heavily weighted on the industrials. So you can see that around 23% is industrials and you'll have your financials, also a little bit on the oil and gas. So it's quite well-rounded. And we can see that, like example, if there are any news related to oil or any news related to manufacturing, like recently the trade wars, which impact our manufacturing numbers, all of this will weigh on the Dow heavier. And we can see that if we look at the component stocks, Boeing and uh, Boeing, Goldman Sachs, etc., all actually have a greater weightage in the uh, in the Dow index itself. Whereas for the S and P, the S and P is more well rounded and it's made up of five hundred uh, big cap stocks. So we can see that uh, in terms of industrial weight, uh, industry weightage, we can see that it's actually more diversified more focused on the technology side of things and your financials, et cetera. And you have a co huge component on the consumer side of things as well. Lesser focus on the industrial, so it's more well-balanced as a whole. And so if like example, we can see that things that impact the technology like uh, last night, we can see that uh, when the uh, technology stocks actually recovered, so it actually pushed the S&P higher than the uh, Dow and if you compare in terms of uh, percentage difference in terms of gains. So we can look at this kind of different industries that is actually impacting the different indices to construct uh, our portfolio better or to use it to better hedge the respective uh, markets. So if we look at it, uh, the top few holdings are all in the technology space. You can see Apple, Microsoft, Amazon, and Facebook, etc. And how about for the Russell? The Russell itself is actually comprises of 2,000 uh, small, cap, small to mid cap companies. So you can see it's very well, uh, very well uh, balanced out. And it's actually similar to the S&P, except the S&P is focused more on the big cap. And you can see that the Russell is more on the small cap. So something good about the small cap is that if like example, the big market moves, you can see that the small cap will move uh, faster. However, if it drops, the small caps will drop even faster as well. So we can see a bigger swings in the Russell itself and investors with a higher risk appetite actually can actually could consider uh, using the Russell to hedge or using the Russell for speculation. So we can see that the Russell 2000 index actually uh, comprises of 2000 different stocks. So the weightage for each stock is relatively uh, smaller as compared to the, uh, to the others like the Dow and the S&P. And lastly, the NASDAQ. The NASDAQ, as we all know, is very technology heavy. So you can see that uh, people who like technology uh, exposure and everything like that, they will actually go into the NASDAQ itself. So the NASDAQ, if you look at it, you can see that approximately 61.3% is actually comprised of technology stocks. So last night, the NASDAQ was very active. We can see that uh, when there was, uh, when actually Netflix uh, announced results that were not very fantastic, fell below expectations, the NASDAQ fell the most, but after Amazon uh, started recovering, it brought the entire technology sector up, and you can see NASDAQ recovering faster than the rest as well. So if you look at things like that, if you look at the top components, you will see that actually Apple, Amazon, Facebook, your FANG stocks actually comprises of a large component of it. And it can be used as a proxy to actually invest into the FANG stocks itself because a large component is actually moved by FANG stocks. And so what are the main differences uh, between these indices? Firstly, the S&P is a rare balance and uh, it's more sensitive to things like the tax card and energy deregulation, etc. Whereas the Dow Jones is more heavily weighted on the industrial side of things. So if, like example, you have things impacting your manufacturing sector, etc., the Dow Jones will be moved much more. And for the NASDAQ, it's mainly on the technology side of things. So your FANG stocks, etc., will move the NASDAQ greatly. And lastly, for the Russell, the Russell is uh, comprised of small caps. So uh, things that impact small businesses, 
as well as tax cuts, etc., will actually uh, give strength to the Russell. So uh, based on these four indices, we can actually uh, use what actually suits us better or what industries we want to be exposed to to invest in US markets because they're actually tracking, tracking the different US indices. And from there, if like example, we hold stock positions, equities positions, we are also able to use the various indices futures to hedge on our positions as well. <clears throat> so moving on, what is actually the main key drivers that actually impact US indices? I actually simplify it into these five key points. The first thing is interest rate. Why is interest rate important? Is because we must understand that when we are actually investing, there are actually two key, uh, two key instruments that people use to invest. First uh, will be equities, which include stocks, uh, CFD, uh, futures, etc., or even unit trust, which actually, which actually tracks uh, equities. And the next will be actually bonds. So even when corporates actually choose to decide, they are you, you choosing between these two main mechanisms. So if interest rate is high, basically it means that the risk-free environment is uh, the risk-free rate and the risk-free environment is high as well. So because of that, markets would tend to invest in safe, uh, sort of like risk-free assets like your bonds, your uh, fixed deposits, etc., things like that. And because of that, you have lesser interest in equities, and it will impact the equities indices futures as well. So right now we are having actually a rising interest rate environment and that's why uh, people are actually uh, looking at it and seeing how it's going to impact markets in the long run. Just like last night when uh, Fed Chairman Powell actually spoke uh, because he gave some leeway, etc. Uh, and that he was, he was like not 100% uh, fully hawkish and never give any leeway for three interest rate hikes. We can see that uh, stock markets actually rose slightly. Also, monetary policies by the central banks actually impact markets because they will actually dictate the interest rates for uh, that particular market itself. So with higher interest rates, there may be more uh, investment and interest in that particular country, but maybe more so in the bond space rather than the equity space. Economic data actually shows the importance of sort of like the importance that the uh, economy is going right now and the direction that actually is bringing the economy. So if you can look that markets are very uh, impacted by economic data, if like the GDP results is good, uh, it will actually give strength to the market because it shows that the market is actually uh, very positive and that there's much more strength going forward. Also, uh, if you look at things like that, how, uh, Companies would tend to prefer to look at to look at uh, countries which are more stable. So, like example, if we're looking at countries like uh, Africa with uh, those uh, developing nations which may not have uh, fantastic economic data, usually uh, when investors invest in those countries, they would tend to expect a higher returns because they are putting in much more risk, and that's why economic data tend to move the particular country's indices as well. And we can also see political events are very important. When uh, the country is stable, you can have investors having more confidence in investing in the market in particular, and more funds will actually flow into the market, giving rise to the index. And a very good example will be uh, the recent happenings in UK, whereby the Brexit incident is happening, giving quite uh, un a lot of uncertainty to markets and you can see it impacting the uh, FTSE index. Or even if you look at the recent uh, Malaysia election, whereby we have a change of government in Malaysia itself. And because of that, for a short period of time, there was a lot of uncertainty and it actually weighed on the KLCI. So uh, because of that, uh, the US right now is still deemed as political stable. However, uh, what's coming up right now is the midterm elections uh, in November itself. And so, markets are keeping a close eye on that because if they were to have a change of a government and everything like that, they may cause short-term instability and it will impact markets. Lastly, is the global environment because if the global environment is in a bullish state, what will happen is that more confidence will be in markets and people will actually invest in it more. And we can look at global environments nowadays, it's actually quite, uh, you can see a lot of investors quite panicky because of a lot of uh, unprecedented, 
unprecedented things that is actually happening at the moment. One of which, which is the trade war, whereby it's actually impacting markets confidence. So you can see that over the past month, uh, if you look at the newspapers, it's always on the headlines and people were actually afraid that it is going to uh, derail the uh, booming economy. In fact, if we see uh, newspapers yesterday itself, it was reported that uh, the IMF actually uh, stated uh, if the trade wars were to continue and to blow out proportion, it could derail uh, the booming global economy. And so this uh, global happenings is actually very important and we have to pay close attention to it. And if you look at US itself, US uh, interest rate decisions is actually very data driven. So like going back to the point, we are stating that economic data will actually move a lot of, of, of all these uh, indices and will impact the factors that will impact the indices itself. So you can see that uh, the data is actually split into three main different categories. The first is labor. So labor will include your non-farm payroll, unemployment rate, etc. And non-farm payroll, payroll itself actually is deemed as a very important economic indicator. You can see that uh, in February itself, when the non-farm payroll results were fantastic, uh, markets were fearful that interest rate would rise uh, faster than expected, and we can see it causing a sell-off in US indices. And inflation rate is the key factor that actually uh, the Fed used to decide uh, inflation rate, uh, no, to decide interest rate itself. So because of that, we can see that markets actually will pay attention if CPI numbers are high and prolong, uh, prolongs being stable for a long period of time. Also, the economy is being uh, driven by the GDP results, which actually show the state of the economy. The retail sales, which actually uh, measures the co consumer confidence, because if when people are having, a, when there's more consumer confidence, people tend to spend more and it's reflected in retail sales. Lastly, the manufacturing uh, and service uh, sectors, which President Trump has actually placed strong emphasis on the manufacturing sector. So all of this actually give rise to uh, consumer confidence of the US economy. And if you look last year itself, we can see that the US economy has been very strong since President Trump took over. We can see that we were in a very obvious bull market last year. So you can see that for the Dow, uh, it grew around 25%. The S&P uh, grew around uh, 20%. But the technology sector, which grew the most, grew around 30 plus percent. How about this year? What market do you think we are in? Do you think we are in a bull market or bear market? Well, a lot of people are still saying that we may be in a bull market because uh, markets are still finding some strength to rise higher, but we may be at the end of the bull market. Well, personally, I feel that we are neither in the bull nor bear market, but we are more in a kangaroo market kind of thing, whereby you can see the markets popping all over the place and volatility is still very strong. And one of the main rationale which are going impacting global markets, not just US markets, is the trade and global tensions, where we can see the clash of two major economies, the US and China. So just to have a main flow of things, things st started uh, way back earlier in the part of the year, whereby actually uh, tariffs were placed on uh, Chinese, Chinese washing machine and solar cell imports. And things took a turn for the worse after the aluminium steel and aluminium steel tariffs were announced. But what happened at the end? After going for negotiations, actually both sides agreed on a ceasefire and that they would actually uh, maintain and not impose new tariffs. But this was quickly overturned by President Trump. Uh, less than a week later, and he stated that he was carrying out the tariffs, and this derailed the whole negotiations. Before finally, two weeks ago, we started with this, whereby the first wave of tariffs was actually implemented onto markets itself, and markets during the build-up all remain fearful, and you can see a lot of sell-down in markets. But going forward, this thing may or may not uh, worsen, but we can see that President Trump has been firm about it. He has actually announced a potential second wave of, wave of tariffs as well. And we can see that why the main rationale for the tariffs to take place is because we are looking at things like this, whereby you have a huge trade deficit. 
So the trade deficit in the long run, what we feel is that it still remains unresolved and it can't be resolved in the near future as well because of the considerations between uh, both parties and that neither of them wants to uh, give way to each other. So you can see that a trade deficit actually can only be reduced by two ways. The first way is to increase China's imports of US products, or the second way is to reduce US imports of Chinese products. And if that's the case, you can stabilize out your trade deficit and you won't have to put tariffs in place to actually reduce this deficit. But one of the things that China, why Chinese don't want to import more US products is because the US does not want to sell China what it actually wants. So we must understand what China imports from the US in the long run. China imports things like semiconductors, your know, high technology products from the US itself. And though it also has other things in uh, agriculture, etc., we can see that it's impossible for China for China to actually constantly increase their imports of China, of US agriculture because there is always a limit to the particular consumption numbers that a country can take. And so what they want is actually technology products, but the US refused to sell to them because they are afraid that their technology products may get stolen or uh, duplicated, etc. So we can see that the US has been trying to curb Chinese from buying US technology and China is not able to increase its imports of US products. Meanwhile, the US also refused to uh, reduce its imports of Chinese products as well. Because what China imports to the US are mainly low technology uh, items, things like your television, things like uh, your day-to-day uh, -day household necessities, uh, machinery, etc., as well as your clothes and whatnot. Because if the US actually impose or uh, actually reduce the imports of these products, what would happen is that products in the US would suddenly become very expensive. And this would actually weigh on consumers' happiness because consumer right now they have lesser choices, they have to pay much more for the same ticket item. And because of that, they may actually uh, show it in their votes. And because the midterm election is coming as stated, President Trump does not want to reach that. And we can see that out of all the tariffs that have been implemented on Chinese products so far, the consumer sector was left untouched. So we can see that uh, he's still very wary about this sector. And so you can see that both countries, China is not able to increase their imports. US is not able to decrease Chinese uh, imports of Chinese products as well. So we are at a deadlock whereby we cannot resolve this issue in the short term. And you can see that during the negotiation process, both leaders have also stated that the process is going to be very difficult. It's because they are not willing to use either methods and it's still, le it's still left unresolved. However, there may be a slight light at the end of the tunnel because uh, it has been stated that both uh, countries may uh, go back into negotiation. So we have to see if uh, more details are going to come up from that. But if not, we can see that the situation still remains very difficult to be resolved and that if a second or even a third wave of tariffs come in, it's only going to worsen the situation and put it to a point of uh, no return. You can see that uh, the rationale for these uh, trade tariffs as well as trade imbalance is not uh, unfounded. It's actually uh, rising and we can see that this year itself, it actually uh, worsened. So uh, after the issue was brought up, it recovered slightly, but you can see that the trade balance is still an issue going forward. If we compare over the years, the trade balance has been increasing month on month. So, and that's why President Trump has been bringing it up as an issue and he wants to resolve it. But with him not willing to accept uh, either solutions, it becomes we are in a deadlock situation right now. And you can also see why the US does not want to sell technology products to China. It's because China has this Made in China 2025 initiative, which uh, the US is, very, uh, is rather wary about. One thing to note is that the US itself is strong in the technology sector. So they would, of course, be, be scared if like a country actually surpassing the technology sector. So US companies have, 
have been spending a lot on R and D, and they have been creating uh new products that have been revolutionary. While China or even Asia as a whole, what usually uh they do is they actually uh take these products and they improve on it. So you can see that uh some of the products developed in Asia may not be uh very valuable. Uh, revolutionary, but more of an improvement. So uh, because of that, the US is very strong on IP rights. And we can see it in the recent sort of like uh, them uh, stopping Chinese investment companies from investing in, in uh, US technology companies because they are afraid that their IP rights are going to get stolen and they may lose their position as an IT leader in the near future. So because of this, this is more protection, protectionistic and it's going to be beneficial for the U.S. technology sector as well, because right now they, uh, the U.S. technology sector will feel that their uh, IP issues and that their copyrights are more secure. So it has uh, been a catalyst for the NASDAQ index as well as technology stocks, but on the whole, it weighed down on the global indices because it actually worsened the trade war or in fact the trade spat. And so we can see that the U.S. has not only, uh, the trade tensions has not only been between the U.S. and China itself, but it has also been uh, spreading globally. So because of the uh, steel and aluminum tariffs, other countries have also uh, tried to uh, strike back against the U.S. And we can see that the EU itself have already imposed some duties of which there are still ongoing uh, discussions because the US may want to tax EU on their automobiles. And you can see that even other allies like Japan and Canada have also vowed to actually uh, impose tariffs on the US. So if this really were to carry on and it's not resolved anytime soon, it may escalate further and become a global trade war, which is what uh, markets are afraid of. But, and if we look at it, we can see that even though right now uh, markets are still trying to recover because it's trying to brush off the trade war incident and focus more on corporate earnings, we must note that the fundamental issue still remains unresolved. And it's a, it's a time bomb, I would say, that can go off at any point of time. And when either leaders actually uh, bring up the issue again, it may actually cause a knee-jerk sell-off. And if the situation is bad enough, uh, what will happen is that it can even lead to a global uh, financial crisis. However, what happens is that markets are trying to uh, resolve that situation. They can see that neither leaders want to enter into a trade war. So th keeping that issue at hand, we see as an underlying risk, but we have to look at other factors as well because it's very unpredictable and nobody can tell you definitely whether uh, a trade war will actually uh, blow out of proportion. So if we look at the Dow futures at the moment, we can see that over the first half a year, it has actually declined. Whereas the S&P actually uh, rose slightly, while the mini Russell and the NASDAQ actually rose quite a bit. So what's the difference? It's because we can see that the trade wars actually impacted a lot about the manufacturing. So people are worried that manufacturing numbers may not be that strong because uh, other countries were actually also going to impose tariffs on the US. And so the Dow was impacted more so than the others, whereas uh, the S&P was quite balanced. So the financials and everything did not bad, and you can see it more or less stabilized. But uh, the technology side of things uh, actually uh, was the main driver for the NASDAQ and US indices as a whole. So it still uh, continued its upstream movement. And like stated, because the Russell is actually more uh, small chips, uh, small cap stocks, so its movement is greater. And then uh, if there's a bullish action, it can actually pull markets higher, uh, faster than the rest as well. So these are the, some of the main factors which impacted US in the first quarter. Eh, sorry, first half of 2018. Firstly, it's the start of the new Fed chairman. Secondly, is the implementation of the steel aluminum tariffs. And the third is the normalizing tax cut back. With regards to the continued strength in the technology sector, I will not go deeper into it, but it has been the one giving strength to US indices because like what I st stated uh, throughout the seminar is that markets were actually factoring in 
the IP rights protection issue and see that the technology sector is still booming. There's still new technology developed and it has been a strength for US indices thus far. So for the Fed chairman, we see that this year itself, we changed a new Fed chairman. The, his name is Powell. So uh, he has been in the Fed since 2012. But one huge difference between him and Yellen is that he is much more hawkish than Yellen itself. So you can see during his first FOMC meeting, uh, what he stated is that he straight away raised the future forecast, not for this year itself, but for subsequent years of rate hikes. This actually shows that he has been uh, more hawkish and wants to raise rates faster, even though he said that he wants to keep a fine uh, balance in interest rates itself. And we can see from the latest FOMC meeting statement, and even last night during his uh, speech to the Senate itself, you can see that he's rather hawkish, and the Fed has also removed certain words like the federal fund rate is going to remain for some time below levels, etc., which actually states that uh, they may raise rates faster. Also, he noted that the economy is doing relatively well and the growth rate still remains very favorable and so that uh, interest rates still have room for growth. Also, we can see that more Fed members are actually of the view that they are going to have four rate hikes this year. So because of all of these hawkish factors, like what I stated, if the interest rate goes up, it may impede the growth of the indices. So US index uh, may, be, may have uh, its gains actually kept because of the rising interest rate. Also, we can see that actually uh, Powell downplayed the entire trade tension situation. He's uh, stating that the impact may not be great. But uh, last night during the Senate uh, briefing, he did enforce that if it goes out of proportion, it may uh, derail sort of like the global indices and the global uh, bull run as well. So um, one more thing to note is that Powell actually wants to have a press conference after every FOMC meeting from next year onwards. And how is that going to impact markets? So we must know that the FOMC meeting, uh, when they have a press conference, is usually uh, once every uh, two meetings. So you can see having in March, June, September, and December. And usually during this press conference meeting, what will happen is that the chairman is able to uh, brief the press about his policies and everything and give him a higher chance for, it, for raising rates. So you can see that last year itself, uh, Yellen actually raised rates in March, June, and December during the uh, press conference. So this year, uh, they have raised rates in March and June so far. And so uh, the upcoming uh, meetings will be important because if they raise rates in September, it means that we are going to have four rate hikes this year itself. And so by Powell actually stating that he's going to have a press conference after every FOMC meeting next year onwards. It means that there's a probability that rates may be raised more than four times from next year onwards as well. And it's actually showing that he's quite hawkish about the entire uh, rate raising uh, schedule as well as the entire US economy. And this will weigh on US indices in the long run. So we can see that there has been an increasing possibility of four rate hikes this year as well. At the start of the year, markets were factoring in only three rate hikes, same as last year. But as the year progressed, more economic data released, we can see that right now, uh, markets are factoring in that there may be four rate hikes this year as compared to three at the start. So uh, the last numbers were actually released in, May, in uh, end of May itself. The June numbers have not been released yet, but what has been uh, going on from the other statements, etc., we tend to think that uh, the chances of four rate hikes this year actually already surpassed the chances of three rate hikes this year. This is due to uh, various economic numbers which have been released that all has been very positive. So we can see that uh, unemployment rate is close to a 17-year low. Recently, it aged up slightly, but uh, that's because there are more people actually entering the workforce, thus pushing up the number. But we can see that comparatively, uh, unemployment rate is still very low and it's good for the economy because more people are entering the workforce. We can also see that in terms of GDP numbers, since the financial crisis the last time around, uh, GDP has been rising and it's in the positive region already. This is also the second longest cycle that uh, the US is in a, project, uh, in a growth territory itself. Also, 
uh, PMI numbers, which actually weighs the manufacturing side of things. We can see it has been a constant incline since 2016. So uh, because of that, it shows that President Trump's focus on the manufacturing sector is still uh, pretty much intact and is still giving strength to the market. So because of all of these positive numbers, we can see that it increased the rates of Fed actually raising, uh, increased the chance of Fed raising rates this year at a faster pace than last year itself. We must note that the Fed also placed a benchmark of 2% on inflation rate. And since uh, end of last year, we can see that we are actually way above that region and we have remained above that region for a long period of time. So because of that, it actually satisfied the criteria of the Fed raising rates four times this year as well because of the constantly uh, improving uh, inflation numbers. Another index which we actually used to see is the Personal Consumption Expenditure Index, which are uh, similar to the CPI, but except that it excludes the food portion of things. So we can see it's also close to the 2% target. And should we hit uh, the 2% target uh, this month itself, we can see that it will actually uh, push markets to forecast uh, four rate hikes this year and increase the probability of that happening as well. And the next point that I was stating is that the steel and aluminum tariffs, it has been implemented since June. So because of that, we are actually looking at June numbers, which are still cu coming up at present to see what's the impact on the actual US economy. And if like example, it's greater than expected, we can expect more, slightly a little bit more sell off. We can see that uh, a lot of these countries, at the end of the day, they will still tax the steel and aluminum tariffs. And it's not the first time they ha actually happen in history. So last time itself, it happened during the Bush era, that's uh, 2002 period. We can see that it actually uh, caused markets to decline and caused the US dollar to decline as well. The rationale is because that uh, in the US economy, if you look uh, closely into it, there are actually more uh, companies or more industries that use steel than that that manufacture steel. So if like example, even if you, if you put tariffs on steel and aluminum, it will benefit the people that make uh, steel, but it will not benefit those that actually use the steel. And because of that, we can see that market reacting negatively to it because of the proportion of the different uh, industries in the US. So uh, going forward, we have to see what, how it's going to impact the US economy as a whole. And if it impacts too greatly, we can see that it may weigh on US indices uh, even more. Also, we can see that the tax cut effect actually uh, is smaller as compared to last year itself. So uh, what happened is that last year, markets were actually anticipating a tax cut and it happened as a form of a Christmas present. So when companies reported their fourth quarter earnings this year, a lot of that exceeded expectations and you can see that markets uh, had a huge bull run. But because markets are very forward looking, so they will actually judge the impact based on the fourth quarter earnings and they will increase their expectations for the first quarter earnings this year itself. So when uh, the quarter earnings were reported this year, you can see that uh, for the first quarter, even though earnings were still beating expectations, market did not rally as much. And it's the same for the second quarter earnings. Right now, we can see that earnings are still very positive, but the impact on markets is still not as great as that back in January already. So because of this normalizing tax cut uh, effect on markets, we see slightly right now that there's lesser catalyst as compared to, to the start of the year already. And so we are actually bearish on US indices due to these few reasons. The first is that the US relations with China showing no clear signs of easing. Second is the increased market volatility. And third, that right now we are in a rising interest rate environment. Of course, the bright spot would remain that there's still continued resilience in the technology sector and that President Trump uh, protecting the technology sector is actually going to uh, give strength to the, to the NASDAQ futures, etc. So we can see that US and China relations are still quite tense. They show no clear signs of slowing down. But if the US actually press China too hard, China actually has various ways to counter back against the US. One of the things would be that uh, in terms of treasury bills, you must note that China actually is one of the greatest holders of US treasuries. So if China really were, be to press, were, were to be pressed too hard, 
they could actually sell off their holdings of US treasuries. And this would in turn cause markets to correct accordingly. So if you look at it last time, it has actually happened before, but this was not due to US and China relations. This was due to China's internal debt issue. So they had to reduce margin requirements. And when that happened, we can see that uh, the uh, dollar and the US indices actually was stable, but they did not have they did not rise that much, even though global markets at that point of time were rising as well. So we can see that if now, right now, due to the high tensions and everything, if global markets were to fall, the US and the dollar could fall even greater if China really were to sell off all of its US uh, treasury holdings. And if, if we look at it, we can see China also has other ways to uh, get back at the US. So uh, one of the things is we must note with regards to Chinese investment. If we look at it, US have more investment in China than China have in the US itself. So because of that, if uh, China were to do a any retaliation, the US companies would tend to suffer more. And because of that, it will weigh on US indices. Another thing to note is with regards to Chinese spending. Chinese uh, have been going to the US and have been uh, contributing to tourism spending, etc. So you can see that China's uh, spending in US have been spiking since 2010. And this is excluding the education. We all know that a lot of Chinese actually go to the US for education. So uh, China has done this before, whereby if we look at last year, due to the South Korea Tat missile incident, Ch uh, Chinese actually stopped going to Korea for vacations and impacted Korea's GDP, etc. And when uh, China and Taiwan had some uh, spat uh, earlier, but around last year or two years ago, you, you can see reduce Chinese stories to Taiwan and also affect Taiwan's GDP. So if right now, Chinese were to stop going to the US, US uh, may suffer a little in terms of its GDP, in terms of spendings, et cetera, which can cause a slight decline in its economy. So these are the things you have to take note. And in fact, if you read recently, there have been reports that uh, Chinese are getting more and more fearful about going to the US due to the ongoing escalation between the trade ties. So going forward, you have to see how all of these actually impact the US economy because the US economy may not be uh, affect, may not be affected by the direct tariffs and everything, but all of these soft approaches may uh, dampen US economy as well. We can also see that there has been increased market volatility. So with increased market volatility, people may want to go to risk-free assets instead. And you can see more interest in bonds, et cetera, because right now we are still deemed as a volatile environment. Also, uh, but in a volatile environment, speculators as well as people who actually trade futures will benefit more because uh, they can not only go long and go short, they can also hedge their positions, et cetera. So if you look at it, because of the increased market volatility, there may be less interest in the US equities. And we can see that uh, if you look over here, volatility has risen quite a bit since last year itself already. We can also see that treasury rate, treasury yield rates have started increasing and have actually reached a four-year high uh, last month. It has soared past the 3.11 uh, region. Right now, it has uh, trended back down a bit. But with a uh, rising interest rate environment, we will see uh, more interest towards the bond market as compared to the equities market, and it may weigh on US indices as well. So you can see that there's always a divergence. If, like example, uh, treasury rates are rising, you can see that indices may correct accordingly. So if you look at the forecast itself, you can see right now, uh, even though the markets have, uh, the Dow is especially resilient, it has a bounce off the 200 EMA three times itself. Uh, so it's still actually in a bull market. But we can see that because of all the fundamental catalysts itself, there may be, uh, if through the trade wars or anything erupt all of a sudden, we can see it impacting markets and it to have a pullback. So even though right now we are still considered as quite bullish, we, we may have to take note in case a sudden pullback happens depending on the fundamentals. So the same for the S&P. The S&P bounced off uh, two times uh, oh, uh, actually three times this year as well. But you can see that uh, in terms of the Dow, as compared to the Dow, it's slightly more positive itself. But like stated, 
the big picture still remains, which is the uncertainty of the US and China trade war. Whereas the NASDAQ, we can see more having more bullish strength, it only bounced off two times. And then uh, since then, right now it's, uh, it has also bounced off the uh, 40 EMA. So it shows that actually it's more bullish than the others. It's still, the uptrend is still intact. And should really a trade war happen, the technology side may not face that much of a rough as compared to the others. And for the uh, Russell, like stated, the Russell itself is more volatile. So we can see that it's still relatively positive, but then uh, we have to take note is because if it actually enters a negative territory, it could drop at a faster pace than the other uh, more established indices, which consists of uh, bigger names. So as a whole, for the third quarter 2018 market outlook, I simplify it into the trade and global tensions, the first part, which is at present, there has been no unexpected complications after the first wave of tariffs have been implemented, but the fundamental issues still remain unresolved. So we can actually see, uh, we must actually observe this development and should there be uh, any major developments that actually worsen the whole situation, the sell-off may continue from there. But for the US side of things, we are still bearish on the index because the US and China relations actually show no clear indications of easing at all. There's also still headwinds from the rising interest rate environment as well as the increased market volatility. However, the bright spark still remains, which is the continued resilience in the technology sector. So uh, indices like the uh, NASDAQ may benefit from it. And so after talking so much about the outlook itself, I'm going to tell you how to actually invest into the four indices, which is very simple, via are futures contracts itself. So futures contracts, they're actually derivatives. So they derive the value from the existing assets, which is, the, uh, which is actually the indices itself. So if you look at the various futures contracts, they actually track the index as a whole. They do not last forever. They have an expiry date, but no worries. You could actually just uh, roll, over the, uh, roll over the contracts. They are also leveraged, so you actually only pay a fraction of the amount because we understand that actually the futures index, uh, the index itself can be quite expensive because if you look, the numbers are quite huge. But because they are leveraged, you only pay a fraction of the amount and you are able to free up your cash for other investments. And leverage amplifies both the profit and loss. So uh, if, like example, this market is in your favor, you may even make much more than what uh, you could do uh, what, what you could do actually. So it also allows bi-directional trading, meaning you can buy and sell. So you can do short, which you are not able to uh, short the market for uh, equities itself. So you can use futures to do it. So because of that, there are a few advantages. It allows you short selling. So it allows you, it's also simply simple and it allows you to hedge or speculate. So because it's bi-directional lets you short, you're not restricted by market direction. So right now, since like example for me, I'm still, we are still quite uh, bearish on markets. So because of that, you can use it to uh, use it and uh, short the market and benefit from a dropping, uh, from a dropping uh, market as well. And so if we use it as a trade example, we can see that uh, this year itself, uh, back in February, the unexpectedly positive uh, US non-farm payroll results were announced and markets start falling because they expect interest rate to rise. And if you short the market, over a short period of a few hours, you would uh, be able to gain uh, this difference. So instead of just like uh, only being able to long, which if you are in equities, you are only able to long, you are able to short the market as well. Also, it's very simple. We don't have to analyze a specific stock. We analyze the general market. So you are mainly moved by economic data. So unlike whereby stocks, you still have to analyze the PE value, you still have to analyze uh, the company structure, etc. Now you're looking at the broad, broad side of things. So you, we, it makes it easier for investment. So like example, if the Dow Palmer's uh, 1,000 plus points, this is back in February, if you were a stockholder, which stock would you pick? By the time you pick the stock, market may have moved but you could use a few just to advantage, which is you just short the index because if on a broad based uh, market movement, do, uh, investing in the index, whether in the long or short position, will actually pay off much more so than an individual stock because uh, we wouldn't know which stock to need pick actually. Also, it allows us to hedge as well as speculate. So if you have a stock position right now, you can use uh, futures to hedge it in a 
so that if market uh, go against you, right now you would have you could minimize your losses and uh, sort of like capture the opportunity. Of course, if you don't have stocks, etc., and you want to speculate, you're also able to use futures to make profits as well. So, like example, if you own Amazon and President Trump actually stated uh, this or tweeted this, what would you do? If you said that you would actually short, you would actually sell your Amazon, then the next day you realize that you have made a wrong choice because uh, Amazon rebounded immediately. But what happens is that you can use this as a trading opportunity if you short the NASDAQ because like you can see just now the NASDAQ comprises quite a lot of Amazon as well. If you short the NASDAQ, you would hedge, hedge your position and you could just after once you made profit, sort of like close the position and when markets rebound, you make with it as well. So uh, this is one of the ways people can use uh, futures to their advantage. So we can see that based on those four indices, CME Group actually offers futures that uh, benefits uh, that actually tracks those four indices. So you can see the E Mini Dow uh, futures, uh, E Mini S and P futures, E Mini Nasdaq futures, and E Mini Russell futures as well. So uh, if you like to find out more about this, you can go on to the CME website, whereby they will state the exact contract specs down there as well. Or you can always uh, find Philip futures and then uh, understand more from there. With that, I have come to the end of my presentation. So if there are anything that, uh, any questions, uh, we will take it from there. Uh, thank you all for your kind attention. All right, um, Samuel, uh, this is Sri once again. Um, well, we have a question from uh, Mr. Alan Singh. Uh, his question is, uh, what is, uh, based on what you have covered so far, what's your outlook for gold? Okay, if we are looking at gold right now, uh, I'll tell you more from a currency per perspective because of that, because we actually have a gold analyst that is actually covering the fundamentals, mainly the supply and demand side, but I'll be talking about the correlation between it and the US dollar. So if you look at gold itself, the US dollar has been uh, rising because of the uh, interest rate environment whereby the Fed has been more hawkish than the other central banks. So it has actually weighed on the gold and uh, the gold have plummeted accordingly because uh, of the strength of the US dollar. And then if you are looking at global uncertainties, last year gold actually benefited a lot because uh, we had uh, the, uh, the US and North Korea uh, words of war incident happening. And you can see that markets were on tender hooks because they were afraid that US and China would go into war, uh, US and North Korea would go into war with each other. But uh, this year we can see uh, the, uh, the North Korea su summit happening and tension seem to be easing. So there will be less demand for gold this year as well. And this has actually weighed, weighed on gold. And if we look at it on a technical analysis uh, perspective, we can also see that a double top uh, pattern has actually formed already. And so right now there's still much more downside ahead for the goal itself. All right, so if you have any questions, uh, please type them in the question box and we'll have Samuel uh, go through them shortly. Uh, we'll just give a few more minutes for you to type them down. Okay, next question we have from Wheeling. Uh, the question is, for the current trade war, is China affected the most? Uh, thank you for the question. So I would like to say that it's not a matter of the most or whatnot, but it's about the countries that are impacted. So we can see that uh, aside from the from China itself, the US is definitely impacted by it. China being impacted the most is because if you look at it in terms of the manufacturing space, yes, it's impacted because right now, if you look at the manufacturing numbers, etc., since the trade war has begun, manufacturing numbers have uh, manufacturing PMI numbers have declined slightly, but uh, and we can see that uh, a lot of uh, newspapers or even media have painted China as the weaker party in the whole trade war situation. But we must note that uh, it's not just about the numbers alone. China has, still has a lot of soft power. And right now, what it's trying to do is it's trying to 
uh, make it uh, band the other countries together. And so it has uh, gotten alliances with the EU. And right now, they're also trying to diversify their uh, business model, their trade partners and everything. And all of this will actually uh, help uh, the Chinese economy. So uh, if we're looking at things like that, whereby if you are stating that one party will tend to lose more than the other in a trade war, I would beg to differ because I think all part all parties in the there is a, always a lose lose situation whereby neither party will benefit in a trade war. So if the U.S. constantly actually uh push new tariffs and everything like that, it's also going to hurt the U.S. economy because uh the U.S. it will come to a time whereby the U.S. will have to actually put tariffs on the co uh consumable products that are like your television, etc., and things like that. And it's going to impact your consumers and this will weigh on the GDP. So if you look at trade wars, even in the past, we can see that uh, in the past, there was uh, something called a chicken war that actually happened between uh, the US and the EU. And it actually lasted for quite a while, but end up that uh, neither parties won, economies were badly impacted and so they seized the trade war. So I wouldn't say that China will be the greatest loser in this trade war, but I would say that maybe globally, the whole world will be impacted if this trade war turns global and out of control. All right, we have a question from uh, Kevin Chu. He's asking the uh, outlook for oil. And um, let me see. Um, we have another question from Joanne Lim, uh, which is uh, her question is what futures uh, contract, uh, which futures contract or other is trading regularly with a healthy volume currently in Singapore? Okay, so uh, there are a lot of con there are a lot of contracts that actually trade with a healthy volume, but because we are in partner with uh, CME today, so we will state some of the CME contracts that are actually uh relatively healthy in volume. So you can see like the four US indices that I mentioned are actually uh, strong in terms of volume. Uh, and then we can see that aside from that, uh, you, uh, we are looking at currency indices that the CME offer that actually are also relatively high in volume. So if we are looking at that, because uh, CME is a global exchange as a whole, so what happens is that the volume wise are, is not really that much of a concern so long as the, the contract is actually uh, given high notability. So meaning if a lot of people are following that particular contract, like a lot of people are following US indices as a whole, so you can see that volume actually picks up from there. Yeah. So in terms of other exchanges which offer other indices as well, so long as the indices is uh, worldly recognized and there would be volume for that index as well. Well, we have a very interesting question from uh, Mr. David Lee and uh, a similar question from Wei Ling. How will the uh, China-US trade war affect the Malaysian economy? In terms of the Malaysian economy, Malaysian, the Malaysian side of things, if you're looking, you looking at the economy, they are mainly focused more on the soft commodity side of things. Things like your palm oil, etc., which uh, PM uh, Mahathir is actually trying to uh, expand. So we can see that uh, with regards to soft commodities, if the trade war blew out of proportion, what will happen is that there may be lesser demand for that as well. So it may impact Malaysia in that sense because with uh, lesser interest in part a particular product, the country may not be able to sell that much. Second thing to note is that for Southeast Asian economies, things like uh, for countries like Malaysia, Singapore, etc., we take a lot of pride in manufacturing. So we can see that last year, manufacturing numbers actually uh, for Southeast Asia actually increased as a whole. This is due to demand from China side because what happens is that a lot of Southeast Asian economies, we are actually uh, manufacturing intermediary products for China and China actually assembling them and shipping them to the rest of the world. So if, like example, trade tariffs will be to be put in place and more trade tariffs are placed on Chinese products, there may be less demand for these intermediary goods. And because of that, it will impact Southeast Asian economies as well. So it's a vicious cycle whereby if there's a sort of like there's a gap or there's a stoppage in a particular part of the cycle itself, it's going to weigh on 
is going to impact the uh, relevant economies that actually supply these uh, intermediary goods to China itself. All right, so we can do two more questions. Uh, okay, next one is from Joanne Lim. Are people still uh, trading or is there good volume uh, for the CME Euro dollar futures? All right, if you're looking at a CME, yeah, if you're looking at interest rate futures, so interest rate futures naturally in terms of volume, it may not be as uh, strong as indices futures, but uh, right now because uh, interest rate is a huge thing whereby we can see it being impacted a lot due to the various comments by the relevant central banks you can see it being quite active at the moment as well but of course due to its uh, size as well as uh, capital outlay and everything it's not as uh, liquid as indices futures and uh, with the new so uh, with the news and everything and markets reacting to the news quite quickly uh, investors must be very alert when they are trading uh, sort of like interest rate futures. All right, so the, the last question that we have um, is in terms of uh, the US index and how bearish it is right now. Um, this question is from Sheldon Sim. How far um, will we see the index being bearish? Okay, so uh, thanks, Sri. So what happens is that if you're looking at the index being bearish, we have to see that right now, actually, we are still in a bullish uh, cycle as a whole. So if we look at it, what if we look at the various indices as a whole right now, you can see that it's still above the 200 EMA and that is something that is a strong support for markets. So even if when we are bearish and everything, we are still looking at this as a strong technical support and if it breaks through this level, it shows that uh, the trend have officially reversed and that markets are going to be bearish for quite some time. And if you look at the fundamentals wise, there's still no turnaround story yet and there's, there's so much uncertainty on markets. So if you are talking to one that is just doing uh, technical analysis, they would say that right now there's still much room for growth because we haven't entered negative territory. But I would tend to think that with all the relevant risks on the market, uh, it's right to be more uh, prudent and then uh, we have to take uh, baby steps. So if like example, we see that market started reversing, uh, it may be a sign and should we break the 200 EMA, it may really be a sign that the whole trend has turned bearish already and that there may be more downside risk ahead. So will it spark off the next financial crisis? It's very hard to say, but all we can say is that financial crisis is sparked off by something that is relatively unexpected. So if really the trade war to happen and if to, it's going to accelerate in such a point that markets are unable to forecast it, uh, it will really give, a, give rise to a lot of market fear and the sell-off may be quite great then. All right, thank you so much, Samuel. See you. Uh, and thank you for being a wonderful audience for tonight's webinar. Uh, for all those questions that we didn't have time to address, uh, rest assured, we'll, we'll drop you an email and follow up with them. Uh, if you have any other queries, uh, you can write them to uh, this email address, futures at philip.com.sg. Uh, uh, at philip .com .sg. Yes, that's the one. Uh, so if you have any query, just uh, drop a note down there and uh, we'll respond accordingly as soon as we uh, receive them tomorrow. Um, in the meantime, thank you for being a wonderful audience. Uh, do look out for our follow-up email. And yes, this webinar is recorded, so we'll host the video on our YouTube channel so you can revise whatever we have covered today. All right, have a good night and thank you for joining us till the next webinar. Bye-bye.